Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, bracing for some of the highest fire danger conditions ever recorded as the state's largest fire rages on. Plus, there's a lot to learn from indigenous people's ability to respond to these catastrophes. A reality check when it comes to our perception of how the environment is changing around us. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm producer Lou DeVizio, filling in for Gene Grant. We'll get to that record-setting wildfire in just a moment, but we're tracking several other state headlines. The New Mexico Public Education Department wants to hear your feedback on its new draft plan to address the Yazi Martinez lawsuit. The judge in that case found the state was failing its duty to provide quality education for all students, with specific gaps around Native Americans, special needs students, and English language learners. In about 10 minutes, our Line Opinion panel reviews the proposed changes and answers the all-important question, will the plan work? The state's budget surplus will be higher than expected, according to new data from Santa Fe. In about 20 minutes, the panel will talk through some of the new spending possibilities. But for now, back to the largest wildfire in state history. The Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire has burned more than 300,000 acres, and as of Thursday, it's less than 40% contained. Tracking and mapping fire growth over such a large area is difficult, but it's also vitally important to understand how these fires move. Environment reporter Laura Paskus spoke with one of the people who digs through that data each day to find out how it's done. Hi, Steve Bassett. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, Laura. It's great to be here. So you have been mapping the Hermit's Peak and Calf Canyon fire. I've been seeing your maps um, every day. I was wondering if we could start with where do you get your data and how are you putting these together? Yeah, I have, I've been mapping um, using data provided by the U.S. Forest Service. Um, the daily progression maps that I've been posting online um, incorporate uh, infrared flight data so each evening the forest service or its contractors fly over the fires um, and the hot spots and the perimeter of the fire is easily to easily mappable uh, from that heat data um, and so they upload it to a server and then it, it typically sits there until a public information officer has time to develop it into a format that works for the public um, and with with the skills that i have and kind of the desperation i was feeling uh, I, I went out and grabbed that data and did something with it to, to get some more information out in, into the public hands. Um, and showing this daily progression, the daily growth, uh, communicates a lot of the information that, that people need uh, when they're, they're thinking about these fires. Is my watershed burning? Is my community burning? Uh, where is the fire headed? What are the fuels in front of it? Um, and to be able to, to provide that map, um, using that authoritative data has just been um, helped me feel less helpless uh, and, and feel like I'm helping yeah. uh, in, during this catastrophe. Yeah, I've really appreciated looking at your maps every morning. Um, like you said, you're showing how the fire is moving, where it's moving. Um, and, and the thing that I've really appreciated is is you lay out those numbers every morning of how much the fire grew the previous day. Um, you know, I know the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire now has been burning since April. It's big, it's complex, but I'm curious if there are a few things maybe within the past week that have really jumped out at you about its progression or its behavior. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge the tremendous job that the incident command team and all the firefighters uh, have uh, all the effort that they've put into to shaping the way this fire spreads and, and protecting our communities, watersheds. Um, the, the, the mapping uh, is, is kind of incidental to that, but I'm glad to be able to provide that. Um, they, uh, anyway, hats off to those folks and, and those communities. Um, the, the, the biggest patterns that, that I've seen in, in these data lately have been fire spreading more to the more to the west uh, into the Pecos wilderness, um, but also to the north. Um, the just the, the trends in the wind patterns have been relatively erratic um, that we don't know where this fire is going to burn. Its perimeter is huge, so 
uh, anywhere that there's an uh, active burning within that perimeter, it has the potential to spread, um, usually pushed by the wind. Um, I'm, I'll share uh, this the map from this morning. Today's or yesterday's growth is the darkest red, and it was a really great day uh, relative to the preceding weeks. Uh, just over 1,600 acres burned uh, yesterday, uh, so the increased humidity has really helped with that. Um, you can see a dashed line representing the, um, the boundary of the Pecos wilderness. It's, it's starting to get a foothold over there. Um, uh, lots of continuous fuels uh, for it to burn through. Um, but this, this growth to the Northwest um, ha has been kind of the most, um, most extreme growth recently. Some of these larger areas from, from past wind events, past extreme uh, red flag days uh, were, were really um, shocking. Uh, the scale of, of the, the fire spread within a day. Um, these darker grays are where the fire was uh, almost two weeks, ago, over two weeks ago, um, as it made some big runs um, towards, the, uh, towards these communities, um, through um, and towards these communities. So uh, we've seen moderation of fire behavior since then, uh, but still a lot of potential out there for growth. Yeah, there was one day last week, I recall you posting one of the maps, and the, the previous day there had been like 30,000 acres of growth. I mean, that just seems uh, devastating and remarkable. So when we look at a fire perimeter map like that, um, I like your maps because they, they kind of show the, 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 the changes over time. but. When we look at a map like that, does that mean that there's fire burning or that a fire has burned within that entire perimeter? Or are there pockets within there that maybe haven't burned or are, are, have been burned past? Uh, so within a perimeter like that, there will be varying levels of fire uh, intensity and burn severity. Um, and I'm going to share a satellite image. So this is a false color satellite imagery uh, of the Calf Canyon fire from May 13th. Um, and some, some of the notable elements are the, the flaming front showing up in orange, the, the brightest orange colors, the smoke visible. Um, you can see the, the burned, the darkest burned areas here in purple. Uh, they would show up black if we were up in a satellite looking down. Uh, but with the, the false color, uh, different bands that we can't see, infrared made visible, uh, they show up uh, as, as this deep purple. Um, you can see a mosaic of burn severities in some parts of the fire, uh, but other areas, it's all purple. And those are the places where um, tree mortality is going to be very high. Um, and on a, a huge map like this, of this huge fire, those patches look relatively small, but some of them are miles across in both you know, all, all directions. Um, uh, more recently, we've been seeing um, high, high severity fire just about everywhere, no low severity fire, uh, but I imagine it's still happening out there on the ground. Uh, we're looking forward to doing some additional analysis uh, to look at the effects of uh, forest restoration treatments and um, the kind of patterns within that burn severity. Yeah, so let's talk about that. What do we know about um, forest treatments in the area that has already burned or the areas where it's moving? Do we have a sense of, of what is on the ground there? Yeah, I, I don't have a map uh, of those treatments, but there's a great map produced by folks at Highlands University. Um, they have an interactive map viewer, the New Mexico Forest and Watershed Restoration Institute. Uh, has produced a, a map that shows the overlay of the current fire perimeter and all the treatments that have happened um, uh, to date. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been um, a, a number of them, um, but probably not um, not to a degree where it altered the uh, trajectory of the fire on a landscape scale, maybe locally uh, protected resources and um, pres preserved um, so, some of the habitat and um, ecosystem um, health of those areas. Mm -hmm. So as you've been paying attention to this, and of course this week, this particular fire, the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire, surpassed the Whitewater Baldy fire in size. Um, you know, are there particular, um, as you've been watching and mapping, are there certain things that have surprised you, or is this kind of acting like a fire would act in our climate-changed world? 
Yeah, I, unfortunately, I haven't been surprised. Um, as as we're looking at the uh, extent of of the drying and and the wind, um, this is the type of fire that happens under those conditions. Um, the and the continuity uh, of fuels. Uh, once once a fire starts, uh, there's very little stopping it um, in this landscape. It's um, I've got a context map here um, that just shows uh, it's, a, it's continuous forest um, virtually, you know, all, all the way to Colorado and, and beyond uh, where we're seeing the, the three active fires in, in northern New Mexico, Cerro Palado, Calf Canyon, Hermit's Peak and Cook's, Cook's Peak. Um, the, there's very little, there's, there's few burn scars. The Vibash fire certainly offers um, uh, uh, some um, fuel alteration, but it's an old enough fire scar that the fire is burning through it. Uh, there's there's been a few fires north of the current fire perimeter, um, but you know, very continuous fuels um, over a large area, uh, very little to break up the spread of fire. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Steve Bassett, for joining me. I really appreciate your maps, which, like you mentioned, are coming from the official sources of data, but you're um, putting them up there in, in really helpful ways, so thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura, for that fascinating conversation. We'll bring our line opinion panelists in on the fire discussion in the second half of our show, but for now, we're gonna tackle another state issue, education. Let's start by introducing this week's virtual line panel. First off, I want to let you know I am not Gene Grant. In fact, executive producer Kevin McDonald filling in for him again this week as he looks to bounce back from illness. But we are glad to have attorney Laura Sanchez back with us. She's one of our regulars. Also another regular, Merritt Allen from Vox Optima Public Relations. And welcome back to Dan Boyd, Capitol Bureau Chief at the Albuquerque Journal. And we want to start today with a look at the new draft plan to address the Yazi Martinez lawsuit. That's the 2018 court ruling that found the state had failed to properly educate more than two thirds of K through 12 students, specifically English language learners, Native Americans and special needs students. The long awaited plan released last week aims to address those shortcomings, setting goals for graduation rates, along with math and reading proficiency, among other things. And want to start out, Laura, with you. Are these goals ambitious enough, especially considering the state's plan was released years after it was supposed to be completed? Well, thanks for that question, um, Kevin. And I think, uh, I, of course, you know, there's a lot of people who are going to criticize the timing of when this was released. There was also initially supposed to be a release that was supposed to happen um, during the session uh, or a little bit prior to the session, is my December, understanding. December, I believe. Yeah, December. And so uh, for sure, there's definitely critics out there about the release of this. But one thing that I think we can see is that the, you know, like it or not, the high, the uh, education department took its time and the secretary took its time to uh, look very specifically at these different segments of um, our most vulnerable students to make sure that there was uh, additional resources um, uh, put into the system for them at a time when we're um, we have budget surpluses and we're able to actually um, increase teacher pay as a state and we're actually able to uh, provide additional resources. I, I'm glad to see that they did focus in more specifically into those vulnerable populations. Um, when you look at the numbers of the graduation rates in particular, you can see a huge drop off from um, those in the populations being, you know, Native American, um, students of color, poor, you know, low income, but in particular also uh, special education has a huge drop off. The others are in their 70%. Special education drops down to the 60, 68% level in terms of graduation rates. And it's very important to put money back, resources back into that segment of the population. I think you're going to see certainly the plaintiffs continue to have um, concerns about how this is going to uh, play out, what kind of plan implementation wise there will be and what kind of oversight there will be. But I think this is a good start for them and an important one to, to just hit the ground running with. Yeah, and, and just to build off what you said, among the overall goals, a 15% increase in graduation rates. And within that, as you pointed out, Laura, to keep all of those subgroups within about 5% of each other, so there aren't those discrepancies. In addition, increasing reading and math proficiency by about 50% for those vulnerable groups, all of this by 2025. And Dan, goals are great 
but that game plan of how to achieve those goals is something else entirely. Did you see enough of that substance behind how we're going to get to those goals? Yeah, I, mean, I think there's some some good goals, some ambitious goals there. I, I think trying to to make some of these changes, you know, overnight is probably not likely to happen. I mean, it's going to take, uh, like Laura suggested, you know, these targeted investments, but then also carrying them through over time. One one thing in the report that caught my eye was just kind of the breakdown of the the teaching profession and, and does that reflect the student population? Uh, I think they said, you know, native students make up 10% of the state's uh, enrollment and uh, native teachers are only 2%. Um, and it's kind of similar breakdown when it comes to Hispanic students. So I think kind of trying to, to get new teachers in, in the pipeline, you know, get them the training, um, you know, get them interested in being a teacher and having a, you know, livable wage, th those things will take time. I mean, it could take years to kind of build that up. But I think if you don't have a roadmap, then then certainly it won't happen. Um, I think also with the pandemic, I mean, that's been that's made it hard as well to meet some of these goals. And obviously, a lot of students and, and teachers and families who've had a hard time with the distance learning and uh, now trying to get back to normal. But, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a new normal. So I think all those things have um, you know added, added to the challenge of, of addressing this issue and, and the court ruling. Yeah, and we've talked a lot on this show about those teacher raises, right? In the latest state budget, the governor and legislators significantly increased pay for teachers, and they want to increase that diversity by about 20% of teachers in the classroom. Uh, but is that money going to be enough? I mean, to, again, to say uh, that we want to increase that diversity in the teachers is, is great, but we've been talking about teacher shortages for years. Part of that may be solved by these raises, but uh, if not, what are the big ideas we can come up with to attack, attract and retain new teachers uh, that reflect the classroom merit? What do you think about that? I think there are so many challenges to uh, that exist administratively to uh, simply licensing and bringing onboarding new teachers and APS. Uh, it can take uh, up to 18 months to become licensed once you complete your education. So that drag, that's uh, three semesters uh, just to get a new teacher on board. Then you're on an annual contract and you have to compete for your job. So why would you stay? You know, you get you get into a you get into a school, you um, get a rapport, you like the faculty, and then you're thrown back out into the pool, and you find out you know you may be um, on the east side, close to your house, on tramway, and suddenly the only job that's available for you um, at the end of the school year in the coming August, next coming August, is out is out at Volcano Vista. So that's um, a tremendous challenge. Just the uh, uh, as an army friend of mine likes to call it, the administ administrivia uh, that puts up barriers to uh, keeping uh, good teachers and aides and counselors. Uh, and then, you know, this uh, this lawsuit was not something that came up. You know, this isn't, you know, just in the last 10 years that this has come up. We've got at least five decades of poor performance uh, uh, nationally and decades of inertia and indifference. That's that's what uh, brought this to bear. And this poor this poor performance has impacted our uh, our workforce, our economy. It's contributed to our poverty and our drug use. I think so many of the problems endemic to our state start in our incredibly poor performing education system. So when we talk about you know, is this enough? Are the goals tough enough? I think we really have to talk about implementation. And uh, is PED uh, capable? And are the school districts going to be capable of implementing these changes uh, in a measured way uh, with accountability, with milestones? Do they have the resources and the oversight to, to achieve it? Yeah, and, and another big challenge, which we touched on a lot, not necessarily so far today, but is the internet access, the broadband uh, that we need across the state, huge infrastructure uh, around that as well. And so I'm curious, Dan, you mentioned it earlier, these are things that are gonna take a long time to accomplish. Merritt, you just um, uh, alluded to the implementation and the accountability. So Dan, how do you balance that in the short term between showing progress and yet also understanding that we are going to solve this over generations. Well, I, I think, you know, obviously the resources have to be there, but just uh, I think I think we've seen that just throwing money at the issue isn't enough. 
that you need a plan and you need to do things differently or else it's going to, um, you know, like Merritt talked about, just be continuing the same pattern. I, I also think, you know, that right now the state does have a lot of uh, money, obviously revenue coming in, but that's not a given five, 10 years from now. So, you know, is the state going to make the commitment to to continue these programs, even when we do see those uh, an inev inevitable kind of you know revenue downturn? And Laura, we've got just about a, a minute left. But again, this idea of balancing expectations with this commitment, we'll talk some more about maybe what could be done with some of that money we're seeing in now. But how especially when we see the delays in this draft plan even coming out, uh, there's going to be a public comment period on this, but how do people feel like there's that accountability in place in this? I think it's really important for people that are interested in this issue to weigh in. I mean, not just organized groups who I think are aware of what's happening and are used to putting in um, comments perhaps on uh, when agencies release reports and so forth, but um, you know, there should be parents that are concerned about this. There should be other groups, local governments, tribal governments. Uh, this is a statewide issue um, and definitely something that I think all of us have a stake in. But, you know, to the issue that you asked Dan about with regard to um, infrastructure and broadband, there's such a huge tech gap when you look at uh, these particular populations that are vulnerable. And there is, uh, let's not forget, federal funding that is coming out from the infrastructure bill related to broadband expansion and assistance um, from the Fed. So it's important for the state to get their act together in terms of applying for some of that funding, which is often formula funding that they can then use to try to um, expand that, that infrastructure and make sure that students are connected. Definitely. Much more on that formula funding question to come here on the show. But we mentioned that uh, public comment and the PED, Public Education Department, is accepting comments on this draft plan through June 17th. Just head to the website to find out where you can get involved in that process. Super important that we all do that. We'll be right back for another discussion with our line opinion panel this time about how the state's reliance on fossil fuels impacts our shifts toward renewables. What um, is missed by this fear of what's happening at the end of the world due to climate change is, is really the kind of in, innovative, both social, political, and cultural uh, strategies that Indigenous people have had and have had have been made to to have in order to survive. Hello again to our line opinion panelists and all of you as well. The state's budget surplus is growing faster than expected. Thanks to Dan Boyd for the reporting from you and the journal on all of this. Revenue for the current budget year is now expected to be more than $440 million higher than projected just this last December. Oil production is a big reason why, along with a boost in personal income tax revenue. And inflation is also pushing gross receipts tax revenue up. On the surface, this has to be good news for the state and the coffers, but now comes the task of figuring out how to use all of that money. Dan, have you heard anything about where lawmakers are leaning when it comes to spending this influx of cash? Well, this is kind of the newest uh, influx. You know, already um, during this year's session, there was there was a big uh, windfall of new revenues. Some of that was used to uh, give rebates to taxpayers, you know, to uh, teacher raises, and, and yet even it, looks, it appears that even more money is going to be coming in. Um, I think we have learned, you know, it, it's been a roller coaster ride these last few years. So, so we'll see where it goes from here. But, but this is kind of unprecedented, even uh, to have legislative folks tell me this kind of level of revenue, these these numbers we're seeing. But I, I think, as you mentioned, Kevin, it does kind of, um, you know, on the one hand, revenues are way up, but on on the other hand, you know, uh, folks around New Mexico are dealing with higher gas prices, higher prices at the store. So, um, so I think state officials and legislators are going to have to figure out, you know, yeah, we have all this money, but but a lot of folks are hurting out there. And and what's the best way to put this to use and, and to really address some of these, uh, um, you know, these serious issues facing New Mexico, because the money's probably not going to last forever. Right. And we know specifically that the, the federal influx around the infrastructure definitely not going to last forever. And these debates between recurring costs, non recurring costs. But, Laura, I have to ask, did the special session rebate uh, heyday set a dangerous precedent now with more money coming in that folks will expect another round of rebates. And should that be a consideration, do you think? 
Well, I certainly th agree with you. It sets a, a precedent, or at the very least, it sets a, an expectation that there will be, um, you know, a use for that for those funds in that way. So, but, but the real trick is, you know, how do you deal with um, a, an influx when, when you know that you can't? I mean, and not that it doesn't get done, but you really shouldn't be spending money on things that um, are recurring, things that continue to either grow or continue to. Um, you know, to need funding going forward. Ideally, when you have an influx that's temporary, you want to spend it on things that are temporary so that the, the you know, the amount that comes in matches what the type of service you're trying to provide. So it isn't ongoing. But we have so many needs that are ongoing right now. It is, um, I think it's almost irresponsible for them not to consider some of those, uh, some of those projects and those things, areas. We just finished talking about education being a huge area and an important one in terms of across the board affects so many other areas like crime, you know, economic development, workforce solutions and all of that. So I think it, it's really difficult. We're gonna probably see a lot of proposals given that it's a 60 day session coming up. Um, and, in, and in an election year, of course, you're gonna hear a lot of noise about how the, those funds should be used, but we have to be cautious and not sort of go out and spend, 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 spend and end up you know, being in a really tough place in terms of cutting services once those funds um, you know, go back down because we expect that's exactly what's gonna happen. For sure, and Merritt, again, you've got this push-pull of people who are feeling it in their wallet every day when they go to the grocery store or the gas pump, and that's where those rebates are, are a possibility to help folks. Another thing we've talked about before are the gas taxes, and we know that the governor encouraged the president to get rid of the federal gas tax for a while. It doesn't appear as that's gonna happen, but there's the state gas tax as well. Should they be looking at that if we're not going to look at rebates, do you think? Well, absolutely. I think our entire tax code has to be looked at, uh, in particular GRT. That's been on the agenda session after session and nothing's really been done about it. And I think that really goes to a larger issue, thinking strategically for the legislature and the state does a part-time unpaid legislature really serve the complex needs of our state in the 21st century? And I would say no. And I think we could also look to a real success of a previous legislatures, and that would be the Early Childhood Investment Fund. While we have these surplus funds, why don't we look at an investment fund to fund a paid legislature? a paid professional legislature that would attract a different type of candidate, one that's not independently wealthy or retired or whatever reason, some, and really take the time to look at these issues. You can't get it done in 90 days every two years. That's why we had two special sessions this year. We need um, more time to address uh, the issues of our state. and. I don't think that's um, asking for more government or, or larger government, but I think we need more time and a professional legislature to look at these issues like GRT and tax rebates and also uh, the long-term impacts of we are going to be moving away from fossil fuels in the next 10, 20, 30 years. The large energy companies have said this. We have the opportunity to transition to renewables. There is no plan. This is something the legislature and the administrations in the future are going to have to address, and they're not going to do it in 90 days every two years. You bring up a great point, Merritt, and, and Dan, I'm wondering, you touched a little bit about this in your reporting, but what are the innovative ideas to manage some of these things we are talking about? I did remember reading something about maybe the idea of endowments with that early childhood investment fund so that maybe that starts to create some money that builds on itself. Uh, I hear rumors that Patricia Lundstrom may look at doing away with income tax altogether, at least pushing for that. What sort of out of the box ideas do you expect to see come out of this and with this opportunity coming up in a 60 day session? Yeah, the, um, the, the Legislative Finance Committee Director David Abbey suggested setting up more endowments, maybe even one for the Opportunity Scholarship Program, you know, that, that covers a lot of tuition and fees for for certain certain higher education students and the legislature has done some of that already setting up a, uh, the late former representative Larry Laranyaga setting up a rainy day fund so some of these ideas to maybe set aside some of this money uh, I think certainly it's true that uh, oil is, is higher than ever it makes up 40% uh, of the state budget oil and gas revenues uh, and it's not going to last forever we don't know when that date is but 
for now, certainly the, uh, the, the primary stance seems to be let's, you know, let's, uh, benefit from this while we can maybe set aside some of these monies. Uh, and the scary thing is that there doesn't seem to be anything right now from a revenue perspective to, to kind of replace oil, uh, and gas when those do kind of weigh. I mean, there's renewable energies and other parts of the industry, but nothing that's going to make up, uh, 40% of the state's revenue base. For sure. And long been the, the challenge here in New Mexico. Laura, is there something we can be looking at here given that, right? Because the irony again is that as people are feeling the pain every time they go to the pump, that same pain is filling up the state coffers. Uh, we know there is a desire to get to more renewable energy. Uh, is there a way to use this money to help bridge the gap between the two? What more should we be doing on that front? Sure. So I think there's a lot that could be done to to try to bridge that gap. I mean, we have an opportunity to look to, especially what other states have done successfully, um, to try to transition. But you know, New Mexico really is at the forefront of a lot of uh, policy um, direction in terms of trying to move to um, you know less carbon fuel, um, or I'm sorry, less uh, less fossil fuel. Um, less carbon intensity as we as we work towards the goals of what the ETA was. But when it comes to, you know, our, our certainly our rising gas prices, some of that, obviously, geopolitical issues are affecting that, um, also affecting supply, um, supply chain issues, the pandemic's been a factor. Um, but as we look at also what other states are going through right now, we can learn from it. In California, I was just there last week and in Northern California, and the price of the pump is just unbelievable if you rent a car there and i was you know i'm fortunate enough to be able to um be able to get there and rent a car uh but it's it was painful and we just can't possibly sustain those levels of um, gas prices here in new mexico so it's important that our lawmakers do consider what we can do for folks who are really struggling right now um, not just with gas but also just to keep keep food on the table well, no doubt we'll have a lot more to talk about this as some of those plans come into fruition. We're headed into interim committee season where a lot of these things are talked about. We'll keep track of all that. Thank you all for your important feedback on that discussion. We'll check back in with all of you in a little less than 15 minutes to talk about the record setting fire burning near Las Vegas and what the governor asked for during a recent call with President Biden. The extremes we're seeing in our climate are scary to everyone. And with severe drought condition expected for the foreseeable future, it's easy to feel like we're caught in a helpless situation. Last week, environment reporter Laura Paskus spoke with a professor who shared ways to actively cope with climate anxiety. This week, she talks to Andrew Curley, a professor at the University of Arizona School of Geography, Development, and Environment. He shares his perspective on the impacts of climate change which challenges myths around water scarcity and the narrative of climate catastrophe. Professor Curley, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So your research focuses on the everyday incorporation of indigenous nations into colonial economies. What are some examples of this? Well, my initial research project as a graduate student, I think was the main example that I had in mind at that time, although there's many other examples, but it was the uh, coal economy in the Navajo Nation, which started in the 1960s, at least in an industrial scale, and um, has come to an end in many parts of the reservation over the last few years. And, um, and so it's thinking about the ramifications of that type of economy, that participation in extractive industries, in coal in particular, the kind of work and labor involved, uh, the kind of revenues generated for the tribal government, and then, of course, the environmental consequences of that type of work. And those are the things that are part of the um, colonial uh, economies uh, that you know surround Indian country and, um, and incorporate large parts of our lands into the service of other things. So when we think about coal, a lot of the... Um, energy produced, in fact, all of the energy produced uh, was going toward outside communities um, and going towards specific types of projects. In this case, um, with the with the Kanta mine and the Navajo generating station, uh, the coal was going toward, uh, I mean, the energy produced by coal was going towards the, um, the Central Arizona project, the, the making of this water infrastructure in Arizona. But other parts of the economy, the Navajo mine on the eastern end of the reservation, 
in what is you know part of new mexico um that is uh that's going towards um i think even you a uh, pnm uh, has some some utility stake in these in these um power plants so that's going towards the the places where pnm serves so all of this is to say the kinds of economic activities generated in the reservation and which were structured uh, through a lot of long-term policies from the federal government, a partnership with uh, state officials, um, especially in the 1930s. These, um, these economies are geared uh, toward outside interests and especially uh, other communities, settler communities outside of the reservation. So that's that's kind of my general idea of what colonial economies are. I wanted to talk with you a little bit more about the Colorado River, which is basically, you know, in crisis mode right now for cities and irrigation districts. Um, there's more of a demand for water than there is a supply right now. Um, you've written extensively about the Central Arizona Project, and I heard you speak recently about scarcity and how we don't talk enough about how dams and reservoirs are what you call the concrete manifestations of colonialist ambitions and how they contribute to drought um, and to this narrative of drought and narrative of crisis. Can you walk us through that a little bit? When uh, Boulder Canyon Act was passed, when the Hoover Dam was constructed, you know, there's all this mythology and lore about the construction of these infrastructures, and then eventually, um, Glen Canyon Dam, Parker Dam, um, the Central Arizona Project, all of these dams along the lower basin part of the Colorado River, these um, these dams, um, we're, we weren't asking questions about, oh, this is too expensive, this is not serving enough people, you know, it was all less future-oriented um, um, ideology, like, oh, we need to create cap in order for Phoenix to grow. We need to create, uh, build these dams in order for the Southwest to blossom. And the problem with, you know, obviously there's a different standard being applied when you're talking about dam, we're talking about infrastructures that serve white communities as opposed to infrastructures that serve uh, native communities. And you can guess why the reason, uh, what the reason is for those double standards. And and so when you're thinking about things like the hoover dam when you're thinking about things like cap and you're thinking about um the crisis we're in now and the drought and the, the the effects of climate change on the colorado river you know that's something like you know when you introduce this question you said there the river is in crisis for x amount of people water districts these people all of these people who have been benefiting from these colonial diversions uh for quite some time and and if you take it from an indigenous perspective, if you take it from a Navajo perspective, a Dede perspective, or Hopi perspective, you're going to ha you're going to see that that river has been in crisis for quite some time, going back to uh, these first incursions into the region, going back to the construction of the Roosevelt Dam along the Salt River. You know, once the the colonialists came in and started to dam the river and change the ecology that's when the river started to go into crisis. That's kind of the origin of climate change in the region. It did affect the, the climate, it affected the river, it affected the ecologies of the region. That's exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about climate change. So we can't divorce these infrastructures from the consideration of climate change. And so in the presentation I show, actually that's what ex we include these infrastructures when we're thinking about the effects of climate change. We look at reservoir levels and we say, oh, look, there's uh, there's um, climate change here because the reservoirs are sinking. Well, those reservoirs are those colonial intrusions in the first place. They're not natural. They're not meant. The river was never meant to to sit the way it does behind the walls of these uh, dams. And so that itself is the origin of the problem beyond um, this larger question of uh, of um, uh, declining snowpack or faster or faster melting snowpack or or, or prolonged drought uh, in the region. I mean, those things are also important, but what we're not considering are the effects of these dams. That was kind of the point I was trying to make is like, you look at even how we talk about climate change. We talk about uh, the Colorado River and it being endangered. And it was like, and when the origin point of that endangerment begins in most people's mind is fairly recently, it doesn't go back to the Colorado Compact. I feel 
I, arguably the Colorado compact has had more impact on the Colorado River than uh, the effects of climate change thus far. And so why aren't we talking about that? Yeah, I, and it's and sort of um, talking about these these myths and these different narratives. You know, when we talk about climate change, um, kind of you know across the news media, and it, there's a lot of doom or talk about apocalypse. And you and and many others point out that that's really a Eurocentric narrative um, around nature and around climate catastrophe. Um, what does that miss out on? What is that lacking? How could that be different? How is that different? I'm not the first one to come up with this point. Um, many other uh, indigenous scholars and, uh, and environmental historians even have talked about how um, how the, the, the way we understand time and progress and future catastrophe, um, it is neglecting what is the experience of indigenous nations? What is the experience of, of people on the ground or, mar or people that are sucked up into these systems when, uh, when worlds end? You know, there are these world ending experiences for people that have already happened. And so you're thinking about uh, apocalypse and your imagination is imagining the end of the world for a certain group of people. And usually they're suburban or affluent or, you know, city people or politicians or I don't know what is in the minds of people when they're talking about this apocalypse in the future or these the, the danger of the um, of, of the rivers. But um, what ends what ends up being neglected is kind of these past uh, um, intrusions. And so when you're talking about the damming up of like the Missouri River, right, with the Pixlona Axe and the um, flooding of hundreds of acres of indigenous land that was guaranteed through treaty, that is a world changing experience. That is an apocalypse of sorts. And when you're talking about the building of these dams along the Navajo Nation and the land swaps involved in order to get Lake Powell um, and, and, um, and to still maintain a land base in the Navajo Nation, these are these are apocalyptic uh, scenarios and often, you know, they happen uh, with dams and with the way we treat water in the West. We've created these huge and world changing infrastructures throughout the region that that have also contributed to the changing of the uh, landscape, the urban landscape. You know, e even going through Phoenix or Albuquerque or Santa Fe over the last few years, you see cities growing and growing and growing made possible by these infrastructures. So the worlds are always changing around us. And and what um, is missed by this fear of what's happening at the end of the world due to climate change is, is really the kind of in, innovative, both social, political, and cultural uh, strategies that indigenous people have had and have had have been made to, to have in order to survive across all of these uh, apocalyptic events. You know, we've, we've dealt with uh, all, all sorts of all the all, all sorts of world worst case scenarios you know even being moved physically off of our land at the end of a bayonet um to in Huelde, you know into bosque redondo on the eastern end of, the, of um, new mexico that's between 1862 and 1868 you know that is an apocalypse moment for us and we survived that and we overcame that and and we um we made a new world uh in the navajo nation after that and so there's a lot to learn from indigenous people's ability to respond to these catastrophes and to think about what are the values of a society um, that is um, that has had to overcome all these uh, marginalizations and yet continue to survive. And what is and compare that to the values of a society that are causing those those problems that are causing these catastrophes to occur in the first place. And then maybe rather than uh, uh, um, thinking about technical solutions, we think of um, political and ethical solutions, right? We think about how we treat the planet uh, ethically first before we think about things technically. And I think that gears us in a totally different direction than if we continue to, to, to have this modernist and, and Eurocentric um, idea of time, of progress and, and technical innovation and we have crisis and the solution to those crises is more technology, improved technology. Um, when we're thinking along those lines, we end up 
um, not only creating more problems because you have to create new kinds of industries to serve these new ones, we perpetuate existing inequalities. When we're valuing technological innovation over what are our, over social directionality and what are the values of the society, then um, then we're not looking at other kinds of solutions. Um, how do we how do we uh, work on social, political, and economic inequalities at the same time while we're dealing with things? that are seen to be in the realm of the environment, environmental crises. Um, and I think that is kind of the larger, more, I guess, philosophical question that we have to ask ourselves when we're thinking about um, uh, about these uh, ideas of apocalypse. So I'm sorry, that's a really long-winded answer, and it feels like it's leading, leaving with this kind of vague um, idea of what to do in, uh, uh, in people's minds. But... Um, that's basically where I'm at with uh, with how we were thinking about these things, so, you know, me and other other people who have been writing about this. Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor Curley. I really appreciate it. Yes, you're welcome. Welcome back one final time to our line opinion panelists. With the largest fire in New Mexico history burning right now, the state is taking new precautions to help prevent future fires. Starting Thursday morning yesterday, the U.S. Forest Service instituted Stage 3 fire restrictions. That means all lands, roads, and trails within the Mount Taylor, Mountain Air, and Sandia Ranger districts in the Cibola National Forest are now closed, along with the entire 1.6 million acre Santa Fe National Forest. Merritt, is this, it seems sort of inevitable, but um, does it send an important message, if nothing else? Absolutely, and uh, it, it, it had to be done. Um, and of course, it, it, it's ironic. I was struck by, of course, there is a Washington Post article yesterday about the fires. And what struck me is in that article, uh, unconfirmed reports that uh, the Hermits Canyon or uh, the, the large fire was caused by uh, a, uh, a prescribed burn. I'm like, where have you been, Washington Post? Everyone's saying this. The governor is saying this. This is why we have a state of emergency declared before it's even over. Um, and, and so how it's looked at it through the national lens. And of course, I think unconfirmed reports means the Forest Service isn't admitting it yet. Right. Um, we've got uh, a humanitarian crisis that really boggles the mind. 15 to 18,000 people displaced. Um, that's that, that's a tremendous number, of a thousand to fifteen hundred structures uh, destroyed. This this is very different than the Whitewater Baldy fire that was largely in uninhabited areas of the Gila. So it could just be allowed to burn itself out. This is going to take tremendous uh, uh, manpower and effort, and it is not expected to stop burning until July when the monsoons. Uh, monsoons come. So yes, which could forest. bring flood danger too. We could go right exactly. from one disaster to another. I exactly. It's it's a very fragile time. Um, I did appreciate the Washington Post story picking up on uh, the cultural aspects and the generations um, of uh, of livelihood uh, lost with that because some of our you know our oldest settlements are in the area and the path uh, uh, in the path of the fire but the forest closures uh, I think were inevitable uh, we've had them before uh, I I think everyone is seeing this and I, I I hope we will see more caution and more restrictions to come honestly flip side of that Laura we had a series of fires that were set in the bosque earlier this week here in Albuquerque. And Mayor Tim Keller said that he is intent on keeping the Bosque open for if no other reason, then there are other people in there to catch these things early, to maybe help self-police. Is there an argument to be made that that would be good for the National Forest too? Or is it just too big and too catastrophic of a thing to, to keep it wide open? Well, I certainly think the scale of things are very is very different. I mean, the Bosque is, um, you know, much smaller by comparison, and so you're you're just not seeing the same level of um, of risk to to life and to property as well as to wildlife um, in the bosque. With these, even with a small number of fires that were set, they were able to be contained very quickly. Um, and a large part of that is because so many people use the bosque for recreational purposes. When you're talking about um, the larger fires that have taken uh, taken hold of the state. 
uh, you're just talking about a, a scale of magnitude that makes it much more difficult to get people in and out of there if they're in harm's way. Um, and with the winds, those fires spread a lot faster than, um, you know, than anyone can predict. So I, I do think that there's a big difference there. Uh, but I, you know, it, it, on balance, I think it's important to recognize that this is an extreme, it's an extreme move, um, definitely you know, ratcheting up the, the uh, importance of this to close down um, our national forests. I think especially as we head into the summer, a lot of people look to that for recreation, uh, but it sends an important signal to everybody that uh, we have to do everything we can to, um, to make sure that we're able to have forests in the future, that we're able to you know, contain our wildfires. Um, and be responsible about the way that we use some of those lands. So I think it's the right move for the Forest Service to do. Dan, the governor spoke with President Biden earlier this week, invited him out to see the damage from the Herbins Peak Calf Canyon fire. And uh, the president said he did plan to come visit, but we don't have a date yet. Do you think that that publicity will help with the humanitarian crisis that Merritt mentioned earlier? Yeah, I, I think it would be uh, appreciated, um, and I'm told it. I'm, I'm told it is, you know, likely at some point he'll he will come out. Um, you know, I, I don't know if that would obviously um, remedy some of the, the really serious issues these folks are dealing with, who've had to evacuate, who have lost their homes, um, you know, their livelihoods, animals, things like that. But I think you know this is the you know the biggest fire currently bigging, burning in the country. I, I think there's still. You mentioned the flooding. I mean, there's a lot of questions about watersheds, um, damage to, uh, you know, places like those that, that these people really rely on. And, and still the fire is burning. I mean, we haven't even, uh, you know, fully extinguished it yet. So I, I think a presidential vi visit would show, you know, the, the seriousness of this issue. And, and I think it, um, you know, raises the question, certainly in my mind, you know, whether this is going to be kind of the, the new normal every year for New Mexico, kind of seeing these fires earlier and earlier in the year. and. Um, forest closures, you know, for, for a large part of the summer. I mean, um, that they're tough on a personal level. We love getting out and hiking, but I, I think looking at it from the big picture and, and, uh, you know, what can be done to try to prevent this type of thing from becoming a routine every year occurrence. Merritt, there's no doubt that the governor has been aggressive on, on many fronts. Another thing she did this week is, is call on the federal government to cover a hundred percent of the costs related to the wildfires. Uh, normally, under federal disaster declarations, states end up paying about 25 percent. But because, as you mentioned, the governor uh, reminded that this apparently started as a prescribed fire from the U.S. Forest Service. So her claim is that they should be fully responsible. Is that a fight you think she can win? This reminds me of the release of mine affluent um, in uh, south, uh, southwestern Colorado uh, a few years back uh, by the Department of the Interior. I mean, this is, uh, again, uh, to me, a huge, uh, a huge gaffe at the nat uh, national level. Uh, and uh, the governor in the state and the people of northeastern New Mexico have every right to be angry. And I think the cap from FEMA is $39,500 for home damages when, uh, you know, five generations of uh, your estate has burned to the ground. I, that's, that's not enough. Um, I, th I think uh, uh, the politics are on the right side. Uh, I think it's possible. I think it's possible uh, this is winnable. And certainly I, I think I have an emotional uh, uh, stake in this as I think everyone in New Mexico does. Uh, I think New Mexico's in the right on this one. We've also heard the governor, Laura, of course, call again for municipalities to ban firework sales because of, again, she does not have the authority to do that herself, at least as far as the law stands right now. We have seen some areas do that, but should that just be a given at this point too? Like what are communities waiting for on that front, do you think? Absolutely. I was really surprised when I first uh, relocated back to New Mexico after, um, you know, after law school. Uh, that we didn't have a ban on fireworks. <laughs> it's kind of shocking because I lived, um, you know, I went to undergrad and grad school in Arizona and it was just known that you didn't have fireworks. There were um, displays that were still put on by municipalities and um, they were, you know, it was just, there was just a lot more safety involved. And so it's really surprising that, that there is um, not that same um, level of importance and, uh, and urgency in New Mexico with regard to fireworks. 
And, you know, every 4th of July, those of us with pets know people tend to, you know, it's not really a day. It's like a month or two months worth. Yeah, I was going to say, not just the 4th off. of July. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. happens a lot. And it's just it's just too dangerous all the way around. So I, I'm glad that she came out with an executive order. I think it was April 25th when she um, asked uh, urging the local local municipalities to come out with their own bans under the Fireworks Licensing and Safety Act. But I think some of those um, local communities are a little reluctant because they do get business. Um, you know, they get GRT as a result of that when their sales of fireworks in their in their area. Um, you get a lot of um, out of state companies coming in, so it generates some additional economic benefit. But I think they have to weigh that with the cost of potentially having um, the loss of, of property and, and potential loss of life from uh, from an uncontrolled uh, fire. So I think I think the time has come for them to seriously consider a ban. Yeah. If we're facing a new normal, that may just be part of it as we move forward. Well, thanks again to our entire line panel joining us always virtually on Zoom. Be sure to let us know what you think about any of the topics we talked about on our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram pages. There are a lot of unanswered questions surrounding the prescribed burn that got out of control and turned into the Hermit's Peak fire. And all of us deserve those answers. Our land correspondent, Laura Paskus, is working diligently to get to the bottom of the story. So far, the answer from the Forest Service has been a resounding, that'll have to wait. While all of us understand the urgent need to deal with these wildfires still blazing across our state, it's equally important that we understand what happened and work to find solutions to keep it from ever happening again. Rest assured, Laura and the entire New Mexico and Focus team will keep pushing for those answers. Stay tuned, and as always, thank you for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico and Focus provided by viewers like you.